public goods funding, and we're going to get into what that is soon. And the third thing is challenges. You know, you gotta you gotta do some some full exploration of the space. So first. You know, this is, I, I'm, I work at Optimism PBC, I'm Carl. PBC stands for Public Benefit Corporation. That means that we have a charter to enshrine fair access to public goods and open source software. That means that is our mission, that is something that we value, and that's why this talk is kind of what it is. But first, before I get into the details, you know, just got to shout out Uniswap Launch. Thank you to all the people. Thank you to Synthetics for, you know, being there forever. And thanks to, you know, it's been amazing. All the people who have used it, I feel very, very appreciative. And so, you know, this is just the beginning. It's fast and cheap, and it's, and it's uh, just the beginning. Pretty awesome. And you should try it, but not at this talk, because I'd be rude. But next. We got community rollout, right? We're going to be onboarding more and more projects. Again, synthetics and you know, chain link for the synthetics exchange. Very exciting. Dogecoin confirmed, not really. But the technical roadmap. Let's talk a little bit about that. Because, right, was this scalability talk? Well, the roadmap in an image is this, right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce our footprint. We're trying to upgrade the systems to layer two. In fact, we have a metric we want to reduce our lines of code change in Geth to less than a thousand lines, right? If we can build a system that can tightly integrate like that, that would be an objective. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, performance and stability. Geth has been in production for a long time. Additionally, it makes implementations of the protocol, the optimistic Ethereum protocol. This is a layer two protocol that scales Ethereum. If you're, yeah, you know, that's some context, important context. But it also allows us to stay close to the Ethereum roadmap. It allows us to adopt the various changes that Ethereum is going to make, you know, EIP-1559 and, you know, account abstraction, all of these things, right? And ideally, we can get to a point where Ethereum nodes can support layer one, layer two, various contexts, you know, even multiple types of layer two. But th and that also means that the optimistic Ethereum roadmap is very much the Ethereum roadmap. Like, it's, it's all about alignment. It's all about building on and contributing to. But now, this kind of begs a simple question, a kind of very important question that has troubled me for a very long time, and that is, why has the Ethereum roadmap taken so long to implement? Why are we still suffering from scalability challenges? What is happening? Because all the time we talk about the implementation details, the research questions, and we're like, oh, okay, you know, this is how you solve this problem, that's how you solve this problem, but it doesn't get solved. Like, we don't see these systems in production. What is, like, there's a disconnect, and it's very frustrating. It's like shouting into an abyss, you know? And what are you going to do? Well, it turns out that I think that the problem is a little bit deeper than that. It is an incentive problem. It is the metagame around scaling Ethereum that needs to change more than the specific implementation details of a single project. So scaling Ethereum is an incentive problem. And that is, we are, you know, crypto economics people, we are Ethereum people, that's, that's the lens, you know, you got to look at the game, why are people doing what they're doing? And so, you know, insufficient funds, right, like this is, there is not enough incentive to build on Ethereum. So what are the root causes? There are two root causes that I, you know, I will make the claim. The first one is, quote, not enough funding, right? Not enough funding. And we'll talk about both of these. The second one is poor market incentives for supporting the scalability research and implementation, importantly, and implementation. So let's dive into the not enough funding. Um, so this is you know, a classic image from Vitalik's blog, and it, it shows that we're spending so much more on mining and securing the system than we are in research and development. And Ethereum is in, like an early stage system. It's an early stage startup. Like what, what, who would spend all your money before you finish the protocol on not iterating on your protocol, but actually just you know, securing what is not even production, like you know, production for the globe ready. So this is clearly an issue. But thankfully, you know, there's hope. And layer two is part of that hope, right? We can rewire incentives to support public goods funding and support this research and support the development of Ethereum. And, you know, I, I, this I feel pretty confident about, right? There is definitely a lot of hope here, and we can get that bar to look a lot, you know, a lot bigger. And there are other talks that, we talk, that we've talked about that, but that's not the new kind of new thoughts, right? This is, that's only half the story. The other half of the story is the poor market incentives for actually scaling the system. So let's look at those poor market incentives. There are three major poor market incentives. 
So the current funder of much of the ecosystem is the Ethereum Foundation, let's face it, but more and more DAOs are kind of getting involved. But still, all of these, these suffer from similar issues. But I'll use the Ethereum Foundation as a case study because we've had the most history. So first, it's a single organization. It is a centralized organization. It does not have the ability to predict what exactly is best for the ecosystem, right? That's why markets are beautiful. You, you find a problem and you solve it. So that's, you know, this is this, this kind of like, it's a little bit, they don't have, you know, it's hard to isolate the exact problems for an ecosystem like that. Additionally, there's another layer to the scalability problem. If we want to invest in scalability infrastructure projects, et cetera, that are trying to scale Ethereum, there's also a legitimacy risk for the Ethereum Foundation. So a lot of the Ethereum Foundation's role is, and by the way, the Ethereum Foundation is incredible, and that's where I you know, used to work, and I just, you know, it's everything. But they're doing two important roles. They're funding the ecosystem, but they're also coordinating the ecosystem around solutions, around you know, values, et cetera. And so that is a legitimacy game. And so if, you, if the Ethereum Foundation funds a project, that means that they become much more legitimate within the community's eyes. And if the project does something bad, that actually hurts the legitimacy of the grants program. And so now you have this, like, it's a little bit of a bizarre incentive, right? It's not clear, like, you know, some, like, profit incentive, which is a lot simpler to, to reason about. And then the final thing is that there's no stake in the upside for these open source projects and for these grant funders, right? This is, you know, clearly when you are creating a startup, when you're creating a venture, having skin in the game is extremely important. And that goes for both the project creator and the project funder, like the grants program, right? This is a motivating incentive. It's just not sufficient to be like, oh yeah, altruism is gonna solve it. Like the whole point is we're moving away from altruism and like defining markets which actually are altruistic markets. So these are poor market incentives, real, real problems. And these are the things that limit the scalability of Ethereum because we don't invest in what will actually work. It's like pushing this, you know, this rock up a, up a hill, you know, I don't know what that thing is. No, I'm just kidding. And just you wait forever and ever, and you're like, what is happening? Like, we literally have solutions for all of these problems for the most part. Like, they need a lot more work. They're just like sketches, raw designs, like that kind of stuff. But you just think, and it's like you have one team working on it. It just doesn't, it just doesn't add up. This is like, what an ecosystem that we have here. And you know, it's question, you just uh, can't, can't wrap my head around it. And so people are building on the protocol, but don't fear, don't fear. We've got solutions because that was just the problem statement. We got, we got two more sections, you know, we're, we're doing pretty good. So don't worry, we got it. Retroactive public goods funding. So a few months ago, Vitalik out of nowhere, it was really just like after quarantine, was like, hey, there's this crazy idea called retroactive public goods funding. And it works in this way. And it just could not get out of my head. Like, I, it was like, it's been a, I don't know, people have been annoyed because I just can't stop talking about this thing. And it is very simple. And that is the sign of an ex expertly crafted design. And this, this, the steps are three, there are three simple steps. The first one is you gather funding. Second one, you establish a mission. You know, maybe you establish a mission before you gather funding, but establish a mission. And then you retroactively reward projects and people who contribute to that mission. Those simple steps. So gathering funding, right? You need funding to be credibly sustainable. This is not, it's not enough to say, oh yeah, I have this like, you know, I, I promise, I promise that I'll re reward you if you contribute to the cause, right? Like, oh yeah. No, it's like, I know that I will get a reward if I contribute. Additionally, you need to establish a mission because you need a kind of North Star that everyone is aiming towards. You know that if you really push this project forward, that you will actually be rewarded. So those missions can be scale Ethereum, quite, quite obviously. It can be a billion users, it can be whatever. It can be support, you know, reduce inequality, whatever you really want, right? Then retroactively reward. And this is probably the most like unintuitive part. You have to give people money without expecting them to do work for you, right? You, you're, you're constantly, you know, oh, I'll pay this person to do that thing. No, they have earned the reward. They deserve the money. They should be paid for it. This is, you know, they can go to an island if they want. 
And how do you actually determine what you reward and who you reward? Well, you create something like a results oracle. And in fact, there's, you, can, you should and can have many results oracles. It's, I'm just going to call it one, but this is like one of those systems you, you just copy and paste. So, big question though, right? Okay, so yeah, I, I just did some of this great thing and now I got this reward, but like, how did I get the money to do the great thing? That's like, that's the obvious, obvious like next step, right? Where do you actually go to bootstrap your venture? Well, thankfully, retroactive funding, giving people money for fulfilling a mission, actually bootstraps is part of a larger market or larger multi-sided marketplace where a results oracle with a results oracle, developers that are building towards the mission and investors that can invest in those developers to achieve that goal and that objective. And so what you can see is you can say, okay, the developers, they get an idea and you'll, you'll, you'll kind of notice that this is very similar to systems that we literally work in today. It's just a little, just a little flip and maybe, maybe a little bit more explicit. They pitch some investors, then the investors, if they're convinced, invest in the project and then the project implements the idea, and then they are rewarded for their successful work if they are successful. Of course, not everyone is rewarded, and this is part of the point, right? You need a market force to actually evaluate who is a good predictor of what is going to be a successful project and who is a, you know, actual person who has contributed to that mission. And so, you know, some sad gerbils, but they'll get rewarded in some other way, I promise. Um, and then this, this cycle can repeat and you know, you kind of weed out and you get better and better at achieving your mission, whatever the results oracle says. And in fact, you know, there should probably be a multiplicity of these results oracles. You know, you can get funding from one, two, many, you know, all of that. Um, okay, I mean, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Can you explain a results oracle quickly? Ah, yes, of course. So a results oracle is what judges the results of these projects that whether or not they succeeded, whether or not they failed. So they are the thing, it's like the judgment, it's like the, you know, it's almost like the dopamine system for a decentralized network. It's, it's what, is judge, what, is, what is rewarded. It's the thing that judges the rewards. So, straw man implementation here. Pick an open source project, something that you want to do. This is from the developer's perspective. I'm a developer picking an open source project. I create a project token, you know, for instance. That's a way that I can represent my, my, own, my ownership in this, this idea. Then I'll sell the token to people who believe in me and believe that this project is going to achieve those good results and be rewarded for them. I'm gonna build my awesomeness, of course, of course. And then the results oracle, or many results oracles, deem it awesome. And then they buy those tokens. They establish a price floor for these tokens. Now, this is a kind of representation of what that token price might look like, right? You start out, you know, maybe people, people don't believe yet, right? They don't believe in the beginning. But then it becomes clear that some good stuff is going on and maybe that price goes up. And then boom, the floor kicks in, the blue line, where the results oracle is actually buying a non-trivial sum of these tokens. And so this allows you to get both funding, right, through people who are, you know, investors, and also rewards. These investors can look and, and they can determine what the actual outcome is going to be before it happens. And so this is establishing a business model for something that previously didn't really have a business model and therefore has been neglected by our community. And so it gives it, you know, you can go from idea that is going to further that mission all the way to exit, where you can actually be rewarded for your, for your contributions. So this is a market for producing the public goods that we all need to scale Ethereum. And it doesn't have the limiting factor of legitimacy. These investors, their only reward is through doing good investing. And developers can find problems that they think are the most valuable or that they are uniquely capable of solving and invest in themselves. It's pretty cool. So now, you know, we're trying to solve scalability. Now, you know, we got, we can actually fund it and incentivize it like a true crypto system, you know, to the moon, all that kind of stuff, you know. I had to, I had to throw in at least one thing for the, you know, the DGEN word in the name. It would, otherwise, it would just be a complete sham. Anyway, um, <laughs> challenges. Of course, there are many challenges. You're probably like, wow, there's so many challenges. Well, I'll tell you at least three of those challenges. We can categorize them. First one is the judgment problem. 
Second one, bootstrapping problem. And the third, free rider problem. So first, the judgment problem. Immediately you're like, okay, the results oracle, that sounds like a really hard problem. Absolutely, it is a really hard problem. There is one, one little bit of hope, right? We, we do have governance systems or systems, DAOs, that are trying to you know, invest in projects. And strictly investing in what has happened and judging what has happened is strictly easier than investing in what will happen. That's a good thing. But there's obviously a lot of cases of bad judgment. You don't want centralization. You don't want you know, ran, a random results oracle. That, that would not make sense. So maybe some quadratic funding, futurarchy, non-token governance. I mean, there are going to be a lot of these systems because this is a system for incentivizing people. This is not like, you know, there's no real judgment here. And one of the challenges that I'll highlight is like specialization, right? We don't want to only reward people who like are flashy and, you know, are in the top. No, you want to reward all the people, the cryptographers, you know, create elliptic curves, PCP theorem, all these things. The next thing is a bootstrapping problem. This is the most obvious one. It's, this is a multi-sided marketplace. You need to bootstrap it. You know, it's a bit of a chicken and the egg problem. But I think that's, that's one of those things that we have a little bit more, you know, we're accustomed to. And then finally, the free rider problem. So I've been talking about these public goods, public goods, public goods. And I, I, and I believe that those are, this is, this is the use case. This is like the real strong use case. But I will say that we have to acknowledge the you know, elephant in the room where you know, if a DAO were to be private and were to attempt to free ride off of other public goods funding you know, people, people who are contributing to the, the commons, then someone's just extracting the contributions and then building their own ecosystem for their own profit. That is you know, a classic thing that we will have to deal with and we will have to just acknowledge. So there is a tragedy of the commons when funding public goods in all contexts. But this tragedy of the commons, I hope, can be mitigated by one, our just will, because we want it to be a better future for everyone. But I think there's even rational reasons for this. And you know, here, I'm gonna get a little game theory, but just gotta throw it in, sprinkle it in, it's a crypto talk, you know, game theory is, is, the, is the jam. Basically, if both, if both DAOs are funding public goods, then great, we're in this great equilibrium, right? But if, one, if both of them are funding private goods, then tragedy of the commons, we're not information sharing, we're not lifting each other up, and we get into this problem. But now, of course, if one's public and one's private, we're now in the classic, you know, you're cooperating and the other is defecting, and the defector gets a bigger payout. And so this is like one of those not, not fun things. And unfortunately, you know, it is the rational choice for the private, it is the rational choice in the prisoner's dilemma to defect. But is it rational in all cases? Well, of course, if this is an iterative game, then you know that if you defect every time, then you will get a lower payout. So in fact, the rational choice in an iterated game is to cooperate. So hopefully, when you're thinking, oh, do I want to make my closed source software or my public good, choose the public good, not just for, for me and for the community, but also for Ethers Phoenix. This is you know, the idealized uh, public good savior. And it's kind of the reverse of Ruko's Basilisk. Ruko's Basilisk is this evil AI that's gonna kill you if you don't help it bring to life. But you know what? We're, we're not into killing people in Ethereum. That's, that's one of our tenants, actually. Um, and the, instead, we're into rewarding people. Give all the people <laughs> tokens. And so what this says is Ether's Phoenix, if you help bring it to existence, it will reward you in the future for your early contributions to the public good. And so it's better to be here in the, uh, you know, in the iterated game starting to cooperate early than it is to be back here, you know, cooperating in the end. And so Here's a nice little way for you to say, oh yeah, I'm making a long-term investment when I invest in these public goods. I'm not just being a fool, falling for the tragedy of the commons, but this is not investment advice, of course. And so pray to the, the, <laughs> the ethers phoenix. Did I say ethers paradox? Because I said it multiple times when I was doing this slide. Apologies. It is a phoenix, not a paradox. Um, anyway, chefing up some good Indian food. Um, you know, gotta, gotta throw a little, a little something in. Anyway. Let's scale Ethereum, right? Let's fix the incentives to scale Ethereum cooperatively together. Again, you know, it's Optimism PBC, Public Benefit Corporation. Let's enshrine fair access to open 
public goods, it's, it's important. And of course, okay, I got a I gotta shill, got a shill. You know, we, we need more people to join the cause. You can join the cause by being on the interwebs, but you can also join the cause more directly. So I just got to shill that. Um, you know, if you want to like reinvent capitalism and create a market, which uh, serves as a moral compass for the super intelligent AI, then that would be, that would be lit. Because that's what we're doing right here. You know, we're creating a kind of operating system for humanity. So anyway, love knows no borders. We're working on this open source. Let's fix it and most of all, stay optimistic. Thanks, y'all. So the, I think the counterintuitive aspect to this is that the thing that you're funding doesn't necessarily produce cash flow. Mm. Right, so can you just speak to like why that's okay? Okay, so we have clearly seen that you know platforms and extractive projects produce cash flow, produce revenue, and we've also seen that there is a bunch of memes that that can can, can you know go to the moon, and what this is this is a part of the market that is giving value to the thing, Ethereum, that is producing a bunch of cash flow. It's creating tons of value, but currently it does not have a business model. And so it is in Ethereum's interest, it is in every cash flow generating project's interest to fund, to create a market, to like form this market around things that produce more cash flow for that cash flow generating system. So, it's not quite a meme, it can be a meme, and it definitely should be partially a meme, but it's also value generating. And so it's kind of decoupling the value extraction from the value generation in a way that enables developers like me to build towards value generation. Yes, I guess there's a, a mic somewhere. Yeah, I have a bit of a philosophical question. I just want to ask a question about uh, PBC. So, what is optimism PBC? Mm. Like, um, I think historically, there were like, like Silicon Valley, all of like startups, people try to do a startup, they make lots of money, or fail, the capitalists, right? There are also altruists like Linus Torvalds don't want any money. So. Do you guys want to make money or you're like altruist? Uh, to want the, what, what is PBC? I love this question because it's all about breaking this idea that contributing to public goods and cooperating is not profitable. And in fact, you can generate enormous amounts of value and be rewarded for that value. And the way we can do that most effectively is we happen to have the rails which allow us to program money and program incentives to produce systems that obviously everyone wants. Like, who wants to work at a company that's oppressing people? That's like so bad. But who also wants to work at a company that's not giving you any money? That's also terrible. So why don't we have both of these things where you can work at a company that's bringing people up and you're rewarded for it? Like, it's, it just needs to, it needs to be infrastructure, and this is not just for our community, this is like a larger thing. And this is why I'm so excited about it, and this is why I've been excited about Ethereum. And to think that literally just giving money back to people who have done great work, to think that that is like a, a solution in some ways to the tragedy of the commons was mind blowing. It's not like, oh yeah, E equals MC squared. These are the 15 algorithms that you have to use. It's like, no, bro, just give, give money to people who, are, who deserve it. <laughs> and scale Ethereum. Any more questions? Yes. How do you imagine the funding will come from for uh, mm. paying for the results? That is a great question. So I think it's going to realistically come from many sources. There are going to be many results oracles pushing for many different visions for the future. I think that it will come from our parts of the stack from our, the core protocol, 
because the core protocol, these blockchains, are going to be competing for your liquidity and your interest and your time. And so if you choose a blockchain that's just extracting all your value and not giving it back, that's a pretty, that's a pretty lame deal. So I think there's a, a market pressure even there. Then there are market pressures all over the stack, you know, whether you're extracting it at a, at a front end level, whether you're, whether you're extracting it at you know, a smart contract level, various things, many ways to slice the pie. It's going to be a market and it's hard to express complexity in words because there are only so many. Um, so it's more than what I just said. <laughs> That's the best cop out right there. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it's just the words. I know the answers, but just can't express them. All right, I guess uh, that's it. Let's go uh, fund and build public goods, y'all. <laughs>